Good day, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. This session will begin at the top of the hour. Hi everyone, I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar, Making the Call, Quality in Biomanufacturing. This webinar will describe an interactive movie for teaching created through a joint project between BioLink and Pellet Productions. Both the webinar and the project we describe were made possible with funding from the National Science Foundation. I'm Sandra Porter and I'm going to be your moderator today and I am one of the team leaders on BioLink. BioLink works to improve biotechnician and bioscience education programs because we strongly believe it's important that students who finish college have the skills and knowledge they need to get a job. So today, before we get started, there are a couple things I want to let you know. We're going to be looking at a lot of short video clips and that can take a little more bandwidth than an ordinary webinar. So there may be some variation in internet speeds. If your broadcast cuts out or lags a bit, please bear with us. We're breaking new ground here. Second, we're going to have two points where we break for questions. But we'd really appreciate it if you have questions during the talk for you to type your questions in the chat window during the talk, and then we'll take them in order when we come to the question breaks. Um, our speakers today are Drs. Jeanette Mowry and Lisa Seidman. Both are members of the BioLink leadership team and biotechnology professors at Madison College in Wisconsin. They're also co-PIs on the interactive movie project that you're going to hear about today. Dr. Seidman is the author of a popular textbook on biotechnology and is well known for her work on laboratory mathematics. Dr. Jeanette Mowry has done amazing work as part of a team to identify and describe core bioscience skill standards. And you're going to be hearing about those in the next webinar. I'd also like to introduce Tim Chachomsky from Maricopa College. Tim is going to be helping us out today with technical support. We've got a lot of transitions between movies and webinar and slides and speakers. Now, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Dr. Seidman, who's going to tell us about the movie. OK, thanks a lot, Sandy. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to begin with a trailer for the movie. So, Tim, if you could just go right ahead and put the trailer on, that would be great. Do you want a career where you can make a difference? I'm just trying to figure out whether this is what I want to do with my life. At FranklinBiologics.org, explore the possibilities. Biotech seemed like a good fit. I mean, we make stuff to treat sick kids. See if you have what it takes to work in the fulfilling field of biomanufacturing. This is the fun part. Process alarms? No problem solving. This free interactive video series will lead you through the challenges and rewards of working in a quality biomanufacturing environment. Choose to be an upstream production supervisor, upstream production technician, or quality control analyst. Follow them through real life situations. Ah! At our fictitious biomanufacturing company, Franklin Biologics. Help them make the right decisions in quality. What do you want to do? A. Talk to a scene before re-steaming. B. Mention it to Lorenzo. That could help save people's lives. Endotoxins could kill someone. <laughs> really want to mess with them? And the company. At Franklin, what do we do? We do it. Right. right, right, right. <laughs> yes. Go to franklinbiologics.org, test your skills, and learn what it takes to make the right calls in a quality biomanufacturing environment. It's free. It's fun. And you make the important decisions. FranklinBiologics.org, making the call in a quality biomanufacturing environment. Okay, thank you. 
So what I'd like to do next is to talk to you a little bit about why we wanted to make a production like this. And I think you can see um, from that trailer that what we're doing is using story. We're using drama, characters, to address the challenge of teaching quality and regulatory affairs. So this is a topic that I've tried to teach a lot in a kind of traditional classroom, and I think it's pretty tough. It can be a little bit dry especially when you start to go into things like the Code of Federal Regulations. It can be a little bit complicated, so students understand that you want to make a good product. But when you start to talk about the details of that, it can get a little bit tricky. Um, we want to talk to them about what it feels like to work in this kind of environment. So this is an environment where you can really make a difference. You might be making drugs that save people's lives. But you also can make mistakes, and those kind of mistakes could impact the patient, they could impact the company, they could impact your career. So it's really important that students, um, if they go into this career, make the right decisions. So we wanted to be able to show all of these things using story. And another thing we wanted to do is we wanted to be able to show them what biomanufacturing is in a kind of visual way. So most people have a sense of what manufacturing is, but they certainly have no idea, most people, of what it would be like to manufacture a product in cells. Um, students may know what a laboratory looks like, but they have no idea really what this kind of a biomanufacturing environment would look like. And so um, movie video is a really great way to show that. Um, so this whole production could not have been made unless we had a great collaboration. Um, BioLink, so we had instructors from BioLink very actively involved in this. Um, Jeanette Maori and I and Vivian Ong Winward were very much involved um, in trying to figure out how to do this and thinking about what would be important for students. Um, and then Pellet Productions, um, this is an experienced video production company led by Anthony Manupelli who brought us ATE TV and they actually made this production happen. So first of all, um, Pellet did provide a script writer, that was David Levin. He wrote the script in consultation with industry experts and with input from educators. Um, and what I want to make um, to note here is it took David a couple of years to write this script. And the reason why it took so long is because during that time he went around to companies around the country, to biomanufacturing environments, talked to many people, talked to industry experts, and tried to identify what are the issues and the problems they deal with, what are realistic dilemmas that happen in their companies, what are the most important things they want people to know when those people come to work in their companies. And then the script, as he wrote the script, it was reviewed by industry experts at multiple points to make sure that it's accurate and that it's realistic. Um, we were very fortunate to be able to film the production at Worcester Polytechnic Biomanufacturing Education and Training Center. Um, this gave us access to equipment, to um, a real small-scale production facility, and maybe more importantly, they provided us with um, their industry experts, Dan, Chris, and Kristen. Um, these are people with a lot of experience in the industry, and one or more of them was always on the set at all times to make sure that we didn't make mistakes during the filming and to coach the actors in things like how do you gown and why do you gown? How do you operate this equipment? How do you work in a biological safety cabinet? And they were really great. And then of course we had the expert production team um, that Anthony put together including a professional director, professional camera crew, lighting, sound, and so on. So that's how we did the production. Now, an interactive like this, I think it's really important to point out that we could not possibly show every situation in this production. Um, and you know, there were things that came up in um, David's research that we just could not get to. But I do think there are some important themes here, and, it's, and instructors can emphasize these as they go through the production with their students. The first of these, and the most obvious, is that when you work in this kind of environment, you have to comply with established procedures, and those procedures have a purpose. The purpose of those procedures is to ensure the quality of the product. So that's fairly obvious. Another really important theme that we will be pointing out as we go through this um, webinar today is the importance of integrity and honesty. So we'll come back to that over and over again. And also the importance of teamwork, which is illustrated many times throughout the interactive. Um, the plan for the webinar, because of time constraints, we can't show you the whole thing, but I think we can show you some pieces of it that'll be illustrative. We're going to start with an overview by the CEO, Welcome to Franklin Biologics, and I really like this little piece. It's very short, and what it does in a very short time is to introduce people to what is biomanufacturing. What does it mean to produce a product in cells? So we're going to start and we're going to show you that today. It's, it's really nice. 
then we're going to show you a scene that sets up the dramatic tension in our production, the very bad day. So we're going to start with that so you get a little sense of the drama. And then we will introduce you to the three characters. We will show you a little bit about each character. And somewhere between one to probably not get to three dilemmas per character. Um, and these are just to illustrate some of the uh, dilemmas faced by those characters. Now it's important to know that after each dilemma for each character, we're going to ask you to vote. And depending on your vote, um, we will show you different scenes. So you can decide what choice the character will make at that point. Um, when you get to vote and when you make your decisions about how to vote, I think in many cases you are going to know the, quote, right answer. But you might or might not choose to vote for that right answer. You might choose to vote for what you think your students might say. Or you might choose to vote for what you think would be an interesting scene to see. So you get to choose, and we will play whichever scene gets the most votes from our audience. At the very end, we, um, Jeanette, I'm going to turn the microphone on to Jeanette. And she's going to be talking to you about ancillary materials, a little bit about other materials we have, and some ways in which you can help us to make this production even better. So welcome to Franklin Biologics. Tim, this is your cue. If you could play us the welcome scene, that'd be great. Hello, I'm Alicia Sandoval, and I want to welcome you to your first day at Franklin Biologics. As part of the Franklin team, you're joining a company with a long history of manufacturing products from major pharmaceutical firms. We specialize in the treatment of rare and unusual diseases, and in some cases, we're the only source of those therapies in the country. As an employee, you'll be giving thousands of patients a new chance at life and a better opportunity for the future. So come on in. Our work starts here, in the cell bank. This is where we store cells that have been genetically engineered to make specific kinds of proteins the key ingredients in new products. From a tiny vial like this, we take just a few thousand cells and nurture them as they divide and grow. As the number of cells expands, we transfer the batch to larger and larger flasks and eventually to the bioreactor where the cells continue to grow and thrive until they've created enough protein for us to harvest. When the batch is ready, it's sent to downstream processing where our highly experienced technicians separate protein from the cells and purify it removing any stray cell fragments or unwanted molecules. Then package it into sterile containers for delivery to our happy clients. At Franklin, we believe strongly that quality is king. And with help from employees like you, we're proud to deliver a flawless product every time. We're thrilled that you're helping us help patients and families. So on behalf of everyone here, welcome to the Franklin family. Okay. Thank you, Tim. OK. So the next thing that we want to show you is the bad day. So I guess we'll just go ahead and show you that. Tim, if you could bring us that video. It's been a rough couple of weeks. We lost a huge batch for a client, a big client. And it was our fault. The mistake cost us millions, and the lawsuit, well, Things just went from bad to worse. FDA inspectors came in, found a bunch of violations, non-compliance, falsifying documents. We were barely above water. Had to lay off half our staff, but what else could we do? I never thought I'd be at the helm while a company went down like this. Except I'm not. None of this actually happened. But it could. In this interactive, you can set back the clock and change the way this whole thing plays out. Step into the shoes of three different characters working at Franklin and make real-world decisions about quality. You could play the role of an upstream production supervisor, a production technician, or a quality control analyst. Each has a critical role to play in bioprocessing, and each has to follow strict guidelines for quality. So, are you up to the challenge? Could you stop this disaster before it starts? Click below to find out. Okay, so there we have our tension. All right, so we have three characters. I'll tell you a little bit about them. 
Uh, Corinne Lawton is our associate production technician. She's an upstream technician. Um, I like this character. This is the kind of job that those of us who teach in two-year associate degree programs, this is the kind of job that our students might get. And it's also a really important job. She is at the front line of making this product. Her decisions are really important. And um, I think she's a great character. Kevin Turner is a QC microbiology analyst. And a lot of times, we have students who are very interested in working in the lab, but they may not think about doing QC. This might be a new idea for them, um, a new kind of career that students have not thought about yet. And we have Asim Komani, an upstream production supervisor. Um, we wanted to show somebody who is a supervisor, who has a little bit more authority, um, because many of our students might want to enter at that level, or they might aspire to be in a supervisory position someday. So we wanted to have sort of a broad range of characters that illustrate different kinds of jobs that one might find in these kind of environments. So we're going to start out with Corinne. And uh, Tim, if you could play us our introduction to Corinne. This is you, Corinne Lawton. You are an upstream technician at Franklin. You went to community college to get special training. And now you've got your dream job making treatments that save hundreds of patients' lives every day. The benefits aren't bad either. Lorenzo here followed the same path. He's an old friend, but he's new to the industry. You helped him land a job at Franklin a few months ago. Both of you work for Asim. He's your supervisor and mentor, and you've learned a lot from him. With his guidance, you're hoping you can rise in the ranks. Going to school was one of the best decisions you ever made. Now you've got a successful career in biotech, and you're making a difference in patients' lives. Click Next to continue. OK. So that's Corinne. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go right into one of Corinne's um, dilemmas, which relates to the documentation. You will see as we go through this that documentation comes up over and over again. It was identified as being very important by our industry experts. So Tim, if you could play us um, Corinne's dilemma relating to documentation. Later that day, you're back to work. You and Lorenzo are cruising through some in-process tests, filling out the documentation like you were trained. But then... Oh, man. Something wrong? No, I just wrote the wrong number. Nobody's perfect, but your documentation still needs to be accurate. Should you... A put a single line through the error, add the date and your initials, B, start over with a fresh set of batch record forms, C, scribble over the mistake so it can't be read. OK, audience, now you get to vote. You should see a voting box. Ah, I can see people are voting. Great, keep going. Okay, we're going to stop here. It looks like uh, the winner is A. So Tim, could you please play us A? Put a single line through the error. You think back to your training. Everyone makes mistakes. But if you write the wrong thing down, the error and the correction all have to be part of the batch record. So you put a single line through the mistake, add an explanation, then initial and date the correction. Nice job. Documentation is the bedrock of quality. If you don't record your work correctly, it's as if it never happened. Click Next to continue. OK, audience, so you guys did a great job at coming up with the right answer there. Now, I want to point out, though, um, on this particular dilemma, uh, one of the reasons why I like this dilemma is because it is a problem for my students. Um, so I have, in the past, had students who have done things like keep a separate lab notebook at home so that it would always be neat. And they would try to hand in this very neat, beautiful, secret lab notebook that they were keeping at home. I have had students who have insisted on using pencil in their lab notebooks because they wanted it to be neat. And so um, they would use pencil and erase errors. And of course, these things are not allowed. Um, so one of the issues here, I guess, if I were teaching this, is I would want students to maybe look at some of the wrong answers um, to see why it's so important that we do documentation right. 
Okay, so let's go along to the next dilemma that we are going to show you for Corinne, one more for her. And that would be Corinne and Rufus, her dog. So let's go ahead, Tim, if you could show us this dilemma for Corinne. Got the pH meter, deionized water, Kim wipes. Uh, Corinne, where's the 4.0 standard? It's right here. We gotta get moving. Asim said we need to be done with the probes by lunch if we're gonna stay on schedule. No problem. Production suite, Lorenzo. Uh, no, she's tied up right now. It's your dog walker. Tell her the treats are on the fridge. She said it's important. Hello? Yeah, it's me. What? Is he okay? Uh, okay, um, yeah, I'm at work right now. Can I call you back? Yeah, uh, okay, thanks. What happened? Rufus got hit by a car. He was chasing a squirrel or something and bolted into the street. Is he okay? Yeah, I think so, but my dog walker is being really cagey. Your dog means everything to you, but you and Lorenzo are in the middle of standardizing sensors for the seed bioreactor. If you don't finish now, it could throw your team off schedule. What do you do? A. Stick around and finish the standardization. B. Let Lorenzo handle it. Sign off on the standardization now and leave to take care of your dog. C. Tell your supervisor about the situation and arrange for someone to fill in for you. Okay, it looks like we're running pretty strongly for C. Arrange for someone to fill in for you. Yeah, looks like that's going to be it. Okay, so Tim, could you play C for us? You don't want anyone to read the error, so you scribble it out and write the actual number above it. Oops. Okay, Tim, not the right one. <laughs> You decide you need to go deal with your dog. Listen, I really need to get to the vet. But what about all this? We'll figure it out. I'm going to give Asim a call. Hey, it's Corinne. Yeah, I have kind of an emergency. Good choice. If a personal emergency comes up at work, make sure you talk to your supervisor before you leave. They can help find someone to cover for you so the batch isn't affected. Click Next to continue. So <clears throat> I want to make a couple of points here before we um, go ahead. Um, first of all, this is a nice dilemma for talking about the issues of home life versus work life. Um, it's also a really interesting one if she makes the wrong decision. Um, it, it highlights a really important point. So I think what we're going to do here, Tim, if we could have you run B, the answer, the, the, um, the video that goes with the answer B, could you do that for us? even though that was not the one that people voted for. This is the one that's let Lorenzo Listen, you know the pH it. stuff, right? Uh, yeah, you showed me. <laughs> okay, great. I really need to get to the vet. Whoa. Wait. I mean, we have to do the work together. You've got to sign off on it, right? Yeah, but you've got it down. I mean, I'll sign now and verify later to make sure it's good. I trust you. I guess, but I'm not sure that'll fly. Come on. You've done it a million times. Help me out here. Okay, but you owe me. Awesome. You're the best. You figure that signing off early can't do any harm. After all, Lorenzo knows how to do the procedure. But later that day... So just say thank you. Hey, Corinne. Hi. Have a seat. <clears throat> so, what's up? Corinne, this is Vanessa Clark from Quality. Hi. We just have a few questions. Okay. So, you said that you and Lorenzo standardized the sensors on the seed bioreactor this morning, right? Yep, this morning. Yeah, and I have a signature right here, except that... Except that you weren't actually there when it happened. Well, um, I mean, there was a... there was an emergency. I had an emergency, so... I know. Your dog was hurt. But you signed off on Lorenzo's work without actually seeing it. But I... I... When I came down to the production suite, Lorenzo was working on his own. And your signature was already there. But he's done it a million times. You know he's reliable. I, I just thought you that... You thought what? That it was okay to falsify documents? Come on, Corinne, you know better. 
I'm just really disappointed. Falsifying documents in any way is illegal. Any work you do must be entered into the records exactly. If it's not, you might cause a problem that could lead to enforcement from the FDA or even harm a patient. Click here to play again. Okay. So the reason why we wanted you to see this um, particular um, situation is because a lot of times students understand what they're supposed to do, but they don't understand the consequences. So basically, Corinne, in that case, was falsifying documents, and that is really serious. So we wanted you to see that video, and I think, you know, perhaps that would be an important one to show to your students. Okay, so we are now, I think, at questions, and um, we're going to turn to Sandy, and she's going to tell us if there's any questions. Yeah, uh, Lisa, I have a question for you right now. Um, my question is, how did you come up with the name Franklin Biologics? Sure. <laughs> ah, well, you know, we went through, we went round and round on many, many names, but Elaine Johnson, who is the director of BioLink, um, decided that we should name this uh, company after Rosalind Franklin, and um, of, you know, of course, of DNA fame, and we were very thrilled to discover that nobody had that domain yet, and there is no real company called Franklin Biologics, and so that's how we came up with the company. And so you were able to get the domain name as well? We did. We've got franklinbiologics.com, franklinbiologics.org, and both of those will work, by the way. Jeanette will show you how to get into this later, but both of those will work to get into this production. I really like your logo, too. Could you, just, could you describe what it's showing? Any other questions? <laughs> uh, well, that one is showing DNA. Right? So I guess we can't really get it up on the screen because we don't have it here. But it's based on Rosalind Franklin's famous work. So we used her work in our logo. And um, All right. Pellet, had, um, Pellet had an artist who made that for us. So we appreciate it. It's nice. Okay. Okay. So, so let's go on. Go ahead. Um, unless, Sandy, you've got anything else for us? Okay. Um, not yet. <laughs> so we're going to go to a theme. So I guess we're ready. Um, Tim, if you could. Sh oh, not yet. <laughs> OK. What's up? Not yet? I, I, meant, I meant no questions yet. So Let's continue. To a theme. Tim, if you could show us the first. Oh, OK. <laughs> OK, Tim, could you show us a theme, the introduction to a theme? This is you, Asim Kamani. You're a production supervisor at Franklin and an all-around nice guy. You've spent six years at the company, first as a technician and now a production supervisor. It feels good to have a team of your own. Corinne Lawton is your protege. When she joined the company two years ago, you took her under your wing. Today, she's a solid technician. Lorenzo Cartagena, the new guy. He's an old friend of Corinne's. He doesn't have a lot of work experience, but was a star student in undergrad. You think he's got potential. As a successful mentor, you get to help other technicians come up the ranks. It's a pretty good gig. Click Next to continue. Okay, thanks, Tim. So what we're going to show you next is another introductory scene relating to a theme. So Tim, if you could bring up the meeting scene, we would appreciate that. Hello, everybody. Thanks for taking the time out of your schedules to come here. Mm -hmm. Now, as you may have heard, our company is facing a challenge in the coming months. Stilton Pharmaceuticals is reorganizing, and our contract may be the first casualty. What? Are you serious? Look, it's not a done deal. How could that happen, though? Folks, please, I know you're concerned. They're our biggest client. But that's why I called you here. You've got the training. You've got the procedures. If you stick to those, we'll be fine. Remember, at Franklin, what do we do? We do it right the first time. <laughs> yes, good. Now, we're scheduled to deliver squabinin in four months. If you have any questions, if any problems come up, talk to management, keep an open dialogue, and if you see something, say, say something. something. <laughs> Excellent. OK. Now let's go over a couple of new policies. That doesn't sound good. 
If something goes wrong with the next batch, Stilton could pull their contract, and that would mean huge layoffs at Franklin. Better stay on your toes. Click Next to continue. Okay, thank you. All right, so we are going to go um, to a theme, and we're going to look at his first dilemma. Um, this one relates to an alarm. So, Tim, could you play us a theme and the alarm? Later that month. Oh, oh man. Hey, what's going on? Uh, I don't know. Process airflow seems normal, but I, I keep getting a foam alarm. Let me see. It's foaming a little bit. It's not that bad. This is weird. Lorenzo did everything by the book. What could be causing the foam up? You wonder if the alarm is just a glitch. But if there is foam in the bioreactor, you can't ignore it. What do you do next? A. Improvise and add more anti-foaming agent. B. Ignore the alarm. It's probably a malfunction. C. Stop and troubleshoot the alarm now. Okay. And the votes are coming in. Okay, and it looks like it's, uh, we got one for A. Okay, it looks like it's coming in for C. Okay, um, and this is actually a good clip to show. So, Tim, um, if you could please show us C, stop and troubleshoot the problem. You decide you'd better troubleshoot now. The problem could be serious. I don't like this. Me neither. What do you think we should do? Well, play detectives. Figure things out. You say that like it's a good thing. Well, it is. Uh, sort of. Not good good, but this is the fun part. Process alarms? No, problem solving. Come on, let's get our heads together. You alert your manager and the engineering department, and together, you all try to figure out the problem. Within a few hours, your team finds a bad flow sensor in the process airline. Extra air had been bubbling through the bioreactor, causing the foam up. Good thing you found it early. If you'd waited, you could have ruined the batch. Be sure to investigate every issue until you exactly know why it happened. Click Next to continue. Okay. One reason why I really like that particular scene is because it does point out that even though this is a production environment, um, there's plenty of opportunities to problem solve, to troubleshoot. Things are not always routine. Um, one does have to stay alert, and one gets a chance to do kind of interesting work on many occasions. So I kind of like that. Um, I think, though, we're going to ask Tim to play B, which is where you ignore the alarm. Um, it's probably a malfunction. Because this is one of those cases where, again, students may not understand the consequences of a wrong action. So we're going to run B, ignore the alarm. You decide it's probably a glitch. You guys did everything by the book. It shouldn't be foaming up. It's weird. Uh, what do you think it is? Could be a bad sensor, you know? We've had that happen in the past. Ignore that for now. Keep an eye out on the tank, though, OK? Sure. For a few hours, that seemed to work, until. Hey, Asim. Uh, Asim? Hey, what, what happened? I, I don't know. I'm getting some pretty weird readings. Like what? High pressure, low flow rate, just weird. And the phone's getting pretty high. Oh, man, we got to get this pressure out of control, or. The emergency pressure release just blew. And now the batch is leaking all over the floor. Looks like the alarm wasn't a glitch after all. Foam had been building up in the bioreactor all day until it finally blocked the vent filter, letting pressure inside rise to dangerous levels. Guess you should have troubleshot that sooner. Click here to play again. Okay. So again, this is one of those ones we wanted you to see, because sometimes it's not so obvious what the consequences are. But in this case, the entire batch is lost. And that is a pretty serious consequence. OK, so now we're going to go ahead. And we are going to go to a semen documentation. Um, documentation, again, over and over and over again, identified as, by industry experts as important. Now we're going to look at documentation from the point of view of a supervisor. So Tim, if you could play for us a theme and documentation. 
A week later, you're going over your team's batch documents and notice Lorenzo has been pretty sloppy lately. He's leaving out some units on his measurements. And when he makes a mistake, he keeps scribbling it out. You need to send today's documents on to the quality unit, but there's no way they'll accept it like this. What should you do? A. Pull Lorenzo aside and talk to him about the sloppy work. B. Talk to your colleague in QA about it. She'll know what to do. C. Correct the documents yourself. Okay, time to vote. Um, can you guys see the voting? I see. Okay. Okay. A looks like going for A. Okay. Uh, I guess we can stop. Tim, can you show us A? You decide to talk to Lorenzo directly. Hey, got a sec? What's up? So, I was going through these batch documents. You've been making some errors pretty consistently. Like what? Well, for starters, there were at least three or four times last week where you didn't add units. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. But, uh, I mean, when we're dealing with the bioreactor, we always work in leaders, so shouldn't it be clear by context? Well, you and I know that. But listen, we have real people using these treatments. Their lives depend on it. But I... Look, bottom line is, we got a document by the book. All units have to be added on. So if anything goes wrong, we know exactly what happened along the way. Got it? Okay. I'll keep a closer eye on that, sorry. All right, man, no worries. Good call. As a supervisor, it's up to you to make sure your staff is documenting work the right way. If anything goes wrong, you'll need to know exactly what they did along the way. Over the next few weeks, you work closely with Lorenzo and help him improve his documentation. Before long, it looks like he's shaping up. Good thing you talked to him. Okay, so we like that one. Um, I think it demonstrates some important things about supervisors. But we're also thinking maybe we should show you um, C. Uh, so Tim, if you could uh, queue up a SEMA documentation that choice C. We'd like to see C. Let's correct the documents yourself. Oh man, Lorenzo, this has to be clear. This work just isn't going to cut it. But Lorenzo is a good kid. Okay. You figure you'll just help him out and make a few corrections. No big deal, right? It's just a few small tweaks. But a few days later... Hey, Vanessa, what's up? Uh, isn't this your handwriting? Um, yeah, I guess it is. Asim, you can't just correct those mistakes. It's not a correction. I was just adding a unit for clarity. Same difference. Look, I need you to verify these units with Lorenzo. Unless he writes the units, it could be 3.3 bushels for all we know. Yeah, but I saw him add the right amount. He just didn't write it down. Simple mistake. Asim, I know you like this kid. He's great, but don't let that cloud your judgment. This is, it's, you can't do that. Look, can't we just? What? Look the other way? Come on. You know I can't do that. This is serious. This is falsifying yeah. records. W wait. Wait, I mean... Look, look, I know you've got a great track record, but this goes completely against FDA regulations. This could cost us our jobs. That's not good. If you find a problem in someone's documentation, never change it yourself. Even a small tweak is considered falsifying documents, and that's illegal. Instead, record that you found an error and start an investigation before doing anything else. Click here to play again. Okay, so we wanted to show you that one um, because, again, students may understand what the right answer is, but not understand the consequences, not understand that adding units could be considered to be falsifying the documents. Okay, so let's go ahead and we're going to meet Kevin. Um, and Kevin is our QC uh, microbiology analyst. He works in the QC lab. So, Tim, if you could please give us Kevin. This is you, Kevin Turner a QC analyst at Franklin. You're relatively new to the company, but you've made a lot of friends here, and you love working with them. You especially love working with microbes. That was your passion in college, but you had a hard time turning it into a paycheck. So you went back to community college for extra training. Now you have a steady job with lots of hands-on work. Plus, you're making a difference. 
The therapies your company makes saves hundreds of lives every year. Click Next to continue. Okay. So, uh, our next thing will be a dilemma that Kevin faces. And Tim, let's go ahead and play this dilemma. Kevin retesting. Okay, so we should have voting here. Later that week, you're working with samples from the seed culture. The production team plans to use that culture to scale up the batch. But first, you need to test it for endotoxins, molecules made by certain kinds of bacteria. They're Find poisonous to humans, even. so if you find them, it could mean the culture was contaminated. Endotoxin test? Looks like it's going to be yeah, A. Yeah, about to scale okay, up to the Tim, can you play us A? Just got to make sure the media looks... Find the procedure for a positive test result. You decide to check the procedure. Sure enough, it tells you to alert Kendra. And a few minutes later, she comes by to take a look. Walk me through exactly what you did. Well, I put a mill of reagent into- No, no, start at the beginning. Oh, uh, okay. I grabbed all the materials. From where? Pipette tips from here, tubes from here, and a kit from over here. Wait, that's what you used? Yeah, why? That expired last week. What? But, oh man, I must have gone on automatic. I didn't even check. Well, in that case, I think we're okay to document it and retest the samples. If we get another hit, let me know and we'll take it from there. Mistakes happen. It might be embarrassing, but talking to your supervisor was the right call. When you're in a QC lab, it's never okay to retest a sample without following the right procedure. Later that day, you retest like Kendra asked. But something looks off again. Another hit? You thought the reagent was the problem. But maybe this is real contamination after all. This looks legit. So you ask Kendra to take another look. I think we have the real thing here. So now what? We let production know. Call us Sam and fill him in. He's going to have to trash that flask. Sure. Good work. Nice work. When a test result, nice work. Nice work. A test result nice. flags a problem Thanks. like this, it could mean that the product is unsuitable for use. You can never assume that it is due to lab error. Whenever this happens, click next to continue. Okay, so this retesting one, um, we thought this would be a really um, important dilemma to put in here. Um, if one is in, a, say, a teaching situation, like if in, I'm in my, one of my classes and a student gets a kind of wonky result, the first thing that I would do would be probably have them do the test again. Um, anybody who's worked in a research lab is very used to retesting automatically. However, this is a very different kind of environment. Um, in the past and into the present, um, sometimes in companies, uh, they will try to do what's called testing into compliance. So suppose a product um, 
that's due to be released doesn't quite meet its specifications, or maybe there's some, looks like there might be some low-level contamination. Sometimes analysts have been told, oh, well, just go ahead and test that again. And then they keep testing until they get the result that they want. That's called testing into compliance. It is very much not accepted by the FDA. It's been the cause of a lot of actions against companies. It's still the cause of a lot of warning letters um, against companies. Um, so we wanted to be sure um, to address this. Um, I'm not going to show you uh, B, but, um, oh, Jeanette says we should show it. OK. Jeanette says, go for it. OK, Tim, could you show us B? What happens if you redo the test without talking to Kendra first? Let's see what happens. B. You figure you must have done something wrong. All the other samples were fine. So you mark them as clear on the lab form and move on. Then, a few weeks later. That's not good. Hey, Kendra, I think you should come take a look at this. What's up? I'm getting a positive hit on this endotoxin test. From, from the seed media? Yeah. It might be low-level contamination. Definitely weird. Huh. Yeah, something must have gotten in there. Hey, Kevin, nothing showed up before now, right? Uh, yeah, sort of. What do you mean, sort of? Well, I messed up one of the samples when I was testing it, but it turned out to be fine. You can't just make that call. We have regulations. But I'm sure I messed up somewhere. In school, we retested all the time if we made a mistake. This isn't school, Kevin. You can't just retest until you get the results you want. There are serious regulations against that. She's right. In order to retest, there has to be a documented error that would invalidate the original test. In the investigation that follows, it's clear that one of the flasks really was contaminated, and your poor judgment made you miss it. Now the batch is ruined. When a test result flags a problem like this, it could mean that the product is unsuitable for use. You can never assume that it is due to lab error. Whenever this happens, your supervisor should be notified and an investigation begun to determine whether the test result is simply due to lab error or indicates a real problem with the product. Click here to play again. Okay. So that's retesting. I think it's an important point for students to understand and a little bit tricky. So let's move on to our last dilemma that we are going to show you, which is a pretty straightforward one. This relates to Kevin and teamwork. Um, again, I think students will know the right answer here. Um, what they may or may not understand as well is the, are the consequences of the wrong answer. So Tim, if we could show Kevin and teamwork. You've really settled into a groove. As new samples come in, you process them and send the results out like clockwork. Then suddenly, a temperature alarm on the incubator. Those are John's samples in there, but you're busy dealing with your own work. Should you, A, ignore it, not your samples, not your problem. B, go over and check it out yourself. Okay. So let's have some voting here. Okay. All right. Looks like this is going to be B. Okay. Uh, Tim, why don't you go ahead and play B for us? Go over and check it out yourself. Kendra here. Hey, Kendra. It's Kevin. What's up? Listen, I'm getting a temp alarm on one of the incubators. Hmm, which one? Number two. It's running low. Did you reset it? Yeah, to 37 degrees. Great, nice set. Can you document that and keep an eye on it? I'll get facilities to take a look as soon as they can. Sure, I'll be here. Thanks. I'll let them know it's urgent. Good job. If you hadn't checked on the incubator, the colder temperature would have affected the samples inside. Quality is everyone's job even if the samples aren't yours. If you see a problem, follow procedures and document it immediately. Click Next to continue. Okay, so that one relates to teamwork, which is a theme throughout the entire interactive. And with that, we are going to um, turn you over to Jeanette, and she's going to talk to you a little bit about some of the ancillary materials, um, some of things about teaching this material um, and some ways in which you can help us. So, Jeanette. 
Okay, does everybody hear me? Yes. So um, we've been telling you a lot about the individual scenes and dilemmas uh, in, in this interactive, but we haven't really told you how to access it and what it looks like when you actually go to the site. So I have a screenshot up right now um, to show you franklinbiologics.org, but you can also use franklinbiologics.com. Um, and what I want to point out is that Right here, and you, when you first go into uh, the site, you may only see overview and opening scene. You may not see all of these other scenes developed below. And, but once you click on the little arrows, it will develop that particular drop-down menu for that character. The other thing I want to point out um, is that it is possible to play an entire character all the way through. So if you want to do that, um, you can go from one scene to the next for each individual character, they'll, they'll, depending on your choice in the particular voting, you um, can maybe play it again if you get the, an answer that the, is not particularly correct. So it allows you to choose your own adventure as you go, but also to go through an entire character. And then you can start over with another character. So that's an important point to, um, to remember. Um, and the other thing I want to talk about a little bit is this, this movie is really going to be a great resource, I think, for teaching quality and regulatory um, issues, but it's not all you need, and there are a lot of resources that are currently available for you, um, and then there's some that are going to be developed as part of this particular project, um, and I'm just going to briefly show you what some of those are, and then we're going to want to get your uh, help in figuring out what you might also need to, to continue teaching using this resource. So first and foremost, of course, since we're, a lot of us are BioLinkers, um, is the BioLink website. And there's a section of the BioLink website called Courses in a Box. And that particular uh, section has several resources uh, that are pretty detailed and pertain to quality regulations and standards. One is a, a link to a course. It's, it's a course called Quality Regulations and Standards. But when you dig down into that, it's actually two courses, one from Salt Lake Community College and another from Austin Community College that are individual courses dealing with quality regulations and standards. Also on the Course in a Box site, though, we have other courses that pertain to the issues that are brought up in this interactive. Basic lab methods in a regulated environment deals with the particular laboratory issues that come up. Um, hazardous materials and lab math um, are also relevant to uh, working in a biomanufacturing facility. The other really cool. Um, uh, resource is our, co our colleagues at Northeast Biomanufacturing Center have a wonderful website that has just recently been redone, um, biomanufacturing.org. And there are a lot of resources which directly refer to the biomanufacturing teaching world. Um, this is just showing you a, a, a screenshot of their curriculum section of their website, their textbook. All of the different units of the textbook are available for download. Uh, metrology, validation, quality assurance, uh, you can run through the list, upstream and downstream processing, process development. There's also links to videos there, as well as lab manual uh, for specific uh, laboratory equipment. So that's another great resource. And then the NC Bio Network, uh, our colleagues in North Carolina have developed some really great resources here. If you click on the educational resources section um, of that website, you're going to get to a very exhaustive list of interactive e-learning tools, including uh, good laboratory practice, good manufacturing practice, chromatography, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of stuff is already available for you. But as part of this project, we're actually developing things that are specific to using this interactive production. And um, we're having, right now, we're in the process of finalizing the companion guide to the movie which has background information on the characters, a little more detail about them and, and what they do, as well as a lot more details about the particular regulations and um, the environment that would be involved there. Um, what we would like to hear from you, though, is what else you would like to see um, as, if, as you use this. And sometimes you may not know this today because you haven't had a chance to explore it on your own time, and we've been showing you certain things that we think are great about it, but there's also a lot more to see. Um, you can tell us now. You can ask today. 
um, or you can uh, email us later, and our email addresses are here as well as on the final slide for the, the webinar. So I guess we want to pause now for questions. Yes, do exactly. Do we have any questions? Sam? We do. We do have questions. So the first question is, a few years from now, will the video still be current in terms of the regulations? And if not, can it be easily edited? Um, okay. Um, actually, easily edited, uh, I might not want to uh, specify that. But we chose issues in, in this particular interactive that we didn't think were subject to real specific changes in regula regulations. Things like documentation, uh, pretty straightforward. They haven't changed for many, many years. Uh, retesting, I don't think that's going to go away. So things like the actual assay that you use to uh, find endotoxins, that might change. But the underlying issue, I don't really see that as being uh, something that's going to go out of, out of um, date in the next few years. So that's, I guess, the best I can say about that. Yes, there is a lot of other footage that we have in the can, so to speak. But I don't think it's um, going to be any different as far as the actual equipment used. Okay, okay. anything else? Yes, yes, indeed. Um, Doug Bruce asks if there's a power outage scenario. Indeed. Um, Doug Bruce asks if there's a power outage scenario. Mm. Good idea, Bruce. Doug, um, yeah, uh, we didn't have that. So maybe the next one, next funding cycle. <laughs> OK, we have a request for, this isn't a question, just a comment. A request for a little bit more about GMP, Good Manufacturing Practices. A request for a little bit more about GMP. Yes, and that is going to be in the companion guide. Um, oh, here, let me see if Felisa has something else to say about that. Uh, they want to know a little bit more about GMP. Um, more about GMP was the question. There will be um, more background information in the companion guide. Um, it's not, we're not trying to write a textbook here, and we're not trying to write everything. And some of that material will be in the course in the box in a little bit more detail. But things that directly relate to the movie is what we're trying to put into the um, companion guide. So some of the very specific issues, like particularly documentation, for example, a little bit more about what are good documentation practices, why. Um, so for each of the specific things in the movie, we are trying to get a little bit more background. So I guess the answer is some more background, yes. Okay, and that, that, that leads us into the next question from Laura O'Brien. Can the scenes be labeled for topics like retesting or proper documentation? Uh, yes, they can. And also, there's a, in the companion guide, we plan to put a scene by scene guide uh, in there. But yes, we can relabel those. They're kind of, you know, scene one, scene two, et cetera. Um, they can be, they can, that can be added easily to the website. OK, and now there's a question about how to assess your students' performance as they go through the activity. Well, OK, that's the $24,000 question. Um, we have some in the companion guide. We have some uh, sort of suggestions for how you might do assessments. Um, you know, some of these are, can be paper and pencil, but you know, there's a lot of things that could be better assessed as you know students in the laboratory or in sort of a mock audit or something like that. Um, but there will be suggestions for how you can test your students in that companion guide. And assessment's always tricky. We all know how hard that is to do in any authentic way. OK, uh, now we have a question from Alexis Wright about the educational background that's needed for the QC microbiology analyst position. Educational background that's needed for the QC microbiology analyst. Um, educational background for QC. Well, Kevin we put as one of the people with a bachelor's degree. Um, but I know from you know working here at our college that we do have students at the associate degree level who do work in QC. Um, so I would say that um, you could be a QC analyst probably with an associate degree, depending on the company and what their policies are. Um, and it's also something that might really appeal to somebody with a bachelor's degree. I think from my students, my, or my former students, 
so, some of that had to do with the kind of job they were in. If they were making a, a product that was going to be used in therapeutics on humans, then they might need a higher degree. Where if they were um, doing QC on something like sausages or ice cream, then a two-year degree was sufficient. Um, yeah, I know that it's the case that, um, that, that we have had students doing in food production. We've had lots of students doing QC. But I do think we've also had some um, working on products that might go into the clinic uh, here, in our, you know, here in our environment who might have just had the associate degree. And, and we also know, those of us who work with associate degree students, that a lot of those students do go into companies. They get jobs where maybe they're assisting in the QC lab where they're doing some of the more routine tests. They go on, they get more education and or more experience, and they move up in that environment. I have a question for you, too. Did I see you and Lisa? Did I see both you, Jeanette, and Lisa in the movie? Did I see you and Lisa? Did I see both you, Jeanette, and Lisa? <laughs> you did see us, and you also saw Vivian. So we had the pleasure of being extras in this movie. We got to be in a firing scene You may or, where we were laid off, where you may have seen that in the um, very beginning. We showed you that very bad day. Um, and we got to be in meetings. So those of us who were um, we teachers and some of the production crew who were not actors did get to be extras, and it was very fun. OK, uh, now I have another question for you. And then again, um, I'll also point out, um, uh, okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, one of our, our audience members is working on a bachelor's in micro with an emphasis in pH and CLS, which I'm not actually sure what those are, and uh, is wondering if that's all they need or are there licensing or testing requirements needed before being hired? Uh, and is this specifically for QC that the person is talking about? I, I'm going to assume that it's. I'm not. I'm not really sure of the environment. I do know that this would be sufficient in many of our companies um, where they're working. You know, biotech companies where they're um, beginning to make a product here in Madison, or you know, maybe actually making the product. That that would be sufficient in our companies. Okay, public health. So is the pH and clinical lab science is the CL, CLS. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I think that would be fine in our companies. Okay. Uh, last question here. Do you have suggestions for how to integrate these videos with a reference textbook, doing a deeper dive in the class? OK, I'm going to turn this over to Jeanette. <laughs> well, you know, she's turning it over to me because she wrote the book. So um, you, know, you could use this along with the, the basic lab skills in a regulated environment textbook. Um, that, would, that would be what I would do, but I'm very familiar with that book. So that's the Seidman book. Um, I'm sure there are other ways to do it You know, if you're willing to write a book. <laughs> That's the only one I know of. Lisa's going to take it back. Um, OK, I will just point out that um, for those maybe not familiar with that basic lab skills textbook, um, in that textbook, there are sections, for example, on the bar decision. And the bar decision has a lot to do with the retesting. So if a teacher were, say, you know, sort of got interested in this whole retesting issue and wanted a little bit more background, um, wanted to know about the bar decision, wanted to know about some of the legalities, they could go into the textbook. Again, that textbook is not a GMP textbook, and it's not intended to take the place of a course you know, or a serious textbook in GMP and regulatory affairs. It's not going to take you to the Code of Federal Regulations. It's not going to take the place of that kind of training. But it will go deeper into some of these core ideas and issues. There's a lot more. There's a whole chapter on documentation. Um, so I guess the response to that question would be, if I were doing it in my class, because I am pretty familiar with that textbook, I would probably um, use the material in that textbook for background for students. But this movie is really good for kind of getting students to understand why it's so important to read that textbook. Other questions, okay. Sandy? Oh, uh, well, I guess there, there's one question that's getting typed. And I guess I have a question maybe I could ask quickly. Okay. okay, I guess just a thank you, sorry. Um, 
I have one question. Some of these scenarios, okay. even as an instructor, okay. didn't have obvious answers. So I'm wondering how you, you came up with the answers that were deemed correct. Um, you mean why why would A be the correct answer and not B or C? Okay, well, some of them yeah, are yeah. pretty obvious. Um, but yeah. all of these dilemmas and all of these issues and all of these questions were very, very carefully reviewed by the industry experts. So these are the answers that they were looking for, the industry experts who help with the script and the help with the writing. Um, also, our industry experts at um, uh, Wooster were involved in figuring out the right answers. Um, but what we were trying to do as educators, so Jeanette, Vivian, and I, is we were trying to put in wrong answers. And we were really looking for the kinds of wrong things that people do, um, the kinds of mistakes that people really do make and that really do mess them up, mess up the products, and mess up the company. So actually what was somewhat fun in here was to think not so much about what's the right answer, because sometimes that really is obvious, but what are the things that people really do do incorrectly? What kind of mistakes do they make? Why do they make that? And I think those are really interesting from a teacher's point of view. OK. Well, if you come up with any questions that you think of later, so you'll be able to get hold of. Yeah, so we're finished with questions. Um, if you come up with any questions that you think of later, you can get a hold of Lisa or Jeanette by using the emails you saw earlier, or there, you could use the contact link at BioLink. Oops, let's go. Can we go back a slide? We're, wasn't quite done with this. You can use the contact link at. Oh, there yes. we go. It won't stop. Yeah. <laughs> you can use the contact link at biolink.org. Uh, okay, yeah. so before we conclude, I want to remind you that this webinar was made possible by BioLink and Pellet Productions with funding from the National Science Foundation. I'd like to have let you know you should really visit our websites, biotechcareers.org and biolink.org, where you can find links to our previous webinars, and you can find information about events that are upcoming and presentations from past events. You can also sign up for our newsletter, and there are links to join BioLink if you're interested in biotechnology or bioscience education. Now, before we end up, we're going. To, I'd like to ask you, don't leave yet, to stick around and complete our survey. And before you do that, I want to thank our presenters, Dr. Mowry, Dr. Seidman, and our collaborators at Pellet Productions for a wonderful project. And now the survey is going to appear in another window, and that concludes our webinar. Thanks.